Hello, this is Little Green Ghouls, and welcome back to Goosebumps Revisited, Series 2000. This week, I'm excited to visit I Am Your Evil Twin. I didn't really know what to expect going into this book. I had never heard of it or anyone really talk about it, up until some comments on my last video, which left me a little hopeful. This book did a nice job maintaining interest despite lacking any really big moments until the final portions of the book. It also had a delightfully cruel twist ending for a change, so I recommend checking it out. This cover is interesting because I don't have any recollection of seeing it, but it's a pretty solid one. It's a cover where the longer I look at it, the more I appreciate it. I really like how the upper corner of the mouth lines up between the good and evil twin, and how disturbingly large in general the mouth is. I didn't find any merchandise this week, and the concept art off the wiki is basically just what the cover ended up being as the final product. I almost forgot to mention in the back of the book, we have a pretty fun creep stakes contest, where Stein provided a story starter and kids were supposed to continue the story using the clue words in the back for the next few books. The words for this first chapter were rat and steak, and the story starter was something evil, something cruel. My cousin Justin warned me to stay up from Uncle Clyde's shed. I mean it, he said, don't go in there, whatever you do. I knew this had to be another one of Justin's dumb jokes, so I waited until it got dark, and I crept out to the shed. I wish I had never opened that door, but I did, and now I'll never be the same, because this is what I found. The winner of the contest got a trip to New Orleans, a Goosebump CD-ROM game, and a signed copy of Stein's autobiography, It Came From Ohio. I'm excited to see where this contest goes in these next few books. Our front take says, he's one deadly double, and both the title and tagline for this book do a nice job covering up the real twist of this story. But let's check out the back of this book. My double rounded the corner. He was heading for the front doors. He was getting away. I gritted my teeth and tore around the corner after him, and suddenly I stood face to face with him. Who? Who are you? I panted. Who? The boy with my face gave me a mocking smile. I'm taking over your life, Monty, he said softly, and you can't stop me. Okay, let's start this summary. The book opens with our introduction to Montgomery Adams, which just makes you think of Mr. Burns from The Simpsons right away. Everyone calls him Monty, but I'm going to keep calling him Montgomery because that's more fun. Montgomery is having a short summer visit to his uncle Leo, whose house is a hot mess because he's too busy always working in his lab to do any yard work. It's only half of page one, and it's already clear we'll be dealing with the classic Goosebumps Mad Scientist situation of some nature. Science runs in the family though, because Montgomery's mom is a zoologist, and will be abandoning Montgomery with Uncle Leo at some point while she spends a few months in the jungle studying orangutans. We also learn there's a cousin Nan running around, who is the same age as Montgomery, but she's off at music camp currently, so I'm sure she'll make an appearance at some point since this is all a pretty classic Goosebumps setup. Montgomery, Uncle Leo, and his mom are all catching up in the living room, when Montgomery is startled by a loud sound in the attic, Uncle Leo dismisses it as the house settling, and his mom makes a very odd comment about it being the others, like this is lost or something. We learn that as kids, Uncle Leo and the mom used to believe that there was a secret family living in the attic and called them the others. It's a little bit too on the nose for me for page 4. It jumps to later that night, and Montgomery is trying his best to fall asleep, but is certain he can hear strange screams and growls coming from the attic. He eventually drifts off to sleep, only to wake up mid-surgery in an operating room of some nature. A man in a mask approaches with a scalpel and tells him to relax and to go back to sleep, which Montgomery does. He tells himself it's just a dream and closes his eyes as the surgeon begins to drag the scalpel across his head. This is clearly actually happening in some way, which makes the scene fairly unsettling. We then get some abrupt timeline adjustments to the story. Montgomery and his mom return home, summer passes, it's now October, and Montgomery's mom is off to the jungle to study orangutans while Montgomery stays with Uncle Leo and Cousin Nan. This whole story setup is unusual, and it just further reinforces my theory that the surgery scene was real and not a dream, because otherwise Stein would have just started the story in October, with his mom leaving him with Uncle Leo. Cousin Nan gives Montgomery a house tour, even though he was just there a couple months ago, and Uncle Leo appears to give Montgomery a strange gift. He hands him a metallic rainbow pin shaped like an 8 point star. Nan proudly declares Uncle Leo invented this new metallic material and shows off a pair of crescent moon earrings made from the same stuff. Montgomery reaches for the pin, and Uncle Leo accidentally stabs him in the finger, causing him to bleed, and then Uncle Leo dabs up the blood with a handkerchief, which he quickly stuffs back into his pocket. I find everything Uncle Leo does to be suspicious at this point, and for good reason, because a couple pages later, Montgomery and Nan are eating some donuts when Uncle Leo offers him some apple cider. Montgomery chugs it down, and immediately starts to feel strange. Waves of hot and cold radiate through his body, and then he pukes a green and white substance all over the kitchen floor. It's only page 14 and we have vomit. I think that's a new record. After puking, Montgomery immediately feels better. He checks the list of ingredients on the donuts and learns they were fried in peanut oil. Montgomery is apparently allergic to peanuts and thinks that's what made him sick. I guess vomiting is preferable to going into anaphylactic shock and his throat sealing up. 
He heads to the bathroom to clean up and starts wondering why two people need such an enormous house. As he's walking down the hallway with various closed doors, he starts to feel adventurous and decides to explore a bit. He comes across a staircase to a basement and heads on down. He finds Uncle Leo's study and piano room, but then spots another door hidden in the back. However, before he can open it, he's caught by Uncle Leo, who harshly tells him to never go in there. Uncle Leo then calms down a bit and clarifies that it's his laboratory, and he doesn't want Montgomery getting hurt or messing with any of his experiments. Classic mad scientist behavior. Montgomery then spends the afternoon with Nan, doing 90 kids things, like rollerblading and watching TV. Montgomery complains about how confusing this large house is to navigate, and Nan reveals there's 10 bedrooms that she knows of, so this house really is a mansion. Montgomery wants to know why they have such a big house, and Nan says it's for the mutants. She goes on to say the mutants can't stand light and only come out at night, which is why Montgomery keeps hearing strange noises throughout the house. Uncle Leo feels responsible for them since they were experiments gone wrong, so they keep him around as best they can. Montgomery is processing all of this like holy shit, when Nan reveals she was only joking of course, but we know there has to be some kernels of truth given that this is a goosebump story after all. Nan goes on to say that she's only been in her father's laboratory once, and it really wasn't that interesting. Just lots of test tubes and charts. The two kids watch TV and end up watching the Twilight Zone movie. An excellent choice. Throughout this movie marathon, Montgomery is running through different names that he might like to be called instead of Montgomery. These include Dave, Paul, and Alan. It's an odd scene to include, so something will have to come from this name stuff later on. Montgomery goes to make popcorn, and when he's walking past the closed lab door, he can hear Uncle Leo in there arguing with somebody and calling them insane. All of this is just making Montgomery want to explore this lab even more. He informs Nan about the situation, and she's completely unfazed because it's like, Montgomery, have you ever heard of a telephone? The story jumps to later from Montgomery's first day at Taft Middle School. He has different classes than Nan, so he's off on his own, and it's not off to a good start. When he enters his English class and asks the teacher where he should sit, she gets really abrupt with him and says he should already know. This confuses him, and she goes on to say she already told him where to sit last week, which really confuses him but he sits down trying not to cause any more of a scene. He eventually decides she must just be mixing him up with another kid, but he's the only redhead in class, so he knows that doesn't really make sense. Later in the day, we learn there's an upcoming talent show, so Montgomery decides to do a piano duet with Nan, which is convenient for the plot, since the piano just so happens to be right next to Uncle Leo's laboratory, a prime excuse for some spying. Montgomery heads downstairs to practice when he hears voices in the lab again. He goes to open the door, only to have a strange voice screech at him to shut the door, Moments later, Uncle Leo appears from the lab and insists it was him who told him to shut the door, even though Montgomery knows it was somebody else's voice. The next day at school, we're in art class, and Montgomery is flirting with a girl named Ashley. They're goofing around with art supplies when Montgomery accidentally knocks a bunch of paint onto the floor, causing a mess. The art teacher instructs Montgomery and Ashley to stay after school and clean up the art room. When Montgomery goes to clean up the room later that day, he finds the art room completely destroyed and everybody's art projects trashed. Ashley's in the middle of the room crying, and when Montgomery approaches her, she starts freaking out and saying to get away from her because he's crazy. This throws Montgomery through a loop because he didn't do shit, but Ashley insists she saw him trashing things and then crawling out of the window. Montgomery tries his best to defend himself, but when the art teacher appears, Ashley is sent home and Montgomery is drug off to the principal's office. The principal then starts the conversation off with, so you're back again. This once again confuses Montgomery because he's never met this woman before, but she insists that his smart mouth had him in the principal's office earlier that day. Montgomery begins to wonder if he's blacking out or something because all these adults at school are insistent with their accusations. He's sent back to the art room to clean up the destruction, and while scrubbing, he keeps catching glimpses of movement outside the classroom window. He eventually concludes he's just getting distracted by his own reflection and is just nervous from all this weird stuff. He then realizes his reflection is awfully sharp and clear for a window reflection, and as he's studying it, his reflection suddenly stops copying him and just stands there looking at him. The blind suddenly snap shut and his art teacher is there to tell him to stop gazing out the window and to get back to work. He cleans up the art room to the best of his abilities, but there are still faint paint stains everywhere. While walking home, he can hear branches snapping and gets the feeling that he's being followed. He stops and shouts who's there, only to quickly regret that decision. Three giant boys emerge from behind some trees and are ready to get their revenge because they think Montgomery smashed their art projects. They proceed to pound on him a bit, and he heads home with a torn shirt, a bloody nose, and sore ribs. These boys must have been very proud of their paper mache volcano to enact this level of revenge. Once back at home, Montgomery avoids Nan and heads straight to bed. The story then jumps to next Monday, and Montgomery is suffering through English class grammar lessons. While being grilled on proper nouns, he looks out the window and spots the doppelganger once again staring right at him through the window. You would think somebody else would notice a random kid just staring in the window, especially if they looked exactly like another student, but no one does. Montgomery takes all this to the next level though. He immediately hops out of the classroom window in pursuit of his double. 
Imagine sitting in class and a kid just hops out of the window and races off towards the woods. Montgomery's little adventure was in vain though, because he can't find his mystery twin anywhere and retreats back to class, where the entire room is bewildered by what they just saw. At lunch, he tries to explain the situation to Nan, but she just bluntly tells him he sounds nuts. He decides the next best person to talk to is Uncle Leo, because he'll know if his mom secretly gave birth to twins and hid one. He gets home and confronts Uncle Leo, and to my and Montgomery's surprise, Uncle Leo confirms that he in fact does have a twin. I was not expecting this to be revealed at the midway point of the story, and more at the climax, but there's even more of a plot twist than this. We learn that when Montgomery was born, his father had just died and his mother was a poor student in university. She decided she couldn't possibly take care of two babies, so she was forced to send one away. Montgomery then wants to know where his twin brother ended up, only for Uncle Leo to reveal it was a twin sister, who was actually his cousin Nan, so Uncle Leo took in the missing twin. This is some juicy family drama, and Nan doesn't even know about it yet. Uncle Leo and Montgomery's mother planned on telling them both on their 13th birthday, but I guess now Uncle Leo's gonna have to bump that up a bit. Montgomery is still reeling from this information, but tries to get back on track to solve the mystery of his doppelganger, except Uncle Leo has no idea what Montgomery's talking about, and thinks it just has to be a coincidence. Later, Nan arrives home and Uncle Leo breaks the twin news to her in private. Both kids are in shock, but also think it's kinda cool that they're actually twins. We spend quite a few pages with these two kids trying to process this new information, especially Nan, since she was the twin that was sent away. They also bond over having both stolen parts of a toy train at a birthday party. It's after midnight when Montgomery finally heads to bed, but he gets a mysterious late night phone call, letting him know that he's gonna get it now, and that things are gonna start getting really tough for him. We then jump to four days later, and it's time for the talent show. Montgomery and Nan are up next to perform, when he realizes he can't find a sheet music for their piano duet. He scrambles back to his locker to see if it fell out, but finds nothing. Montgomery starts retracing his steps through the hall, when he's suddenly shoved into a supply closet from behind and locked in. Things get worse for him though, when he smells something strange. It smells smoky at first, but when he investigates closer, he finds a mysterious oily liquid with harsh fumes coming from it. Montgomery then realizes he's struggling to breathe, and begins banging on the door desperately. No one is around and he's starting to feel dizzy when he spots a small window to the outside in the back of the closet. He piles up some boxes and covers his nose with his shirt because the toxic fumes are even more intense the higher up he goes. He eventually is able to crawl out the window and spends a few minutes gasping for air before heading back inside towards the auditorium. Once inside, he's disappointed to see Nan had to start the performance without him, and then freaks out when he spots his doppelganger on stage with her. He races towards the stage and enters through the side curtains, only to have this double launch a full-on piano at him. In all the confusion of a boy suddenly hurling a piano, the evil twin is able to escape undetected while Montgomery wanders onto the stage looking guilty. He ends up chasing after his double again, and this time actually catches up with him. Montgomery begs to know who he is, but in response he gets a punch to the stomach and the mystery twin declares he's going to be taking over Monty's life and that's all he needs to know, before taking off again out the front doors of the school. Montgomery crawls up from the ground and starts to follow after his evil twin. He's so far behind that the twin has started to slow down, thinking he successfully escaped. Montgomery then watches as his twin proceeds to spray paint a car, because this is an evil twin after all. When Montgomery passes the car, he sees the twin is written, Monty loves Ashley forever, which fills him with dread because he knows Ashley walks this way home. He tries to wipe it off with his shirt, but it just smears it around a bit. He continues after his twin, and is unpleasantly surprised when the twin crawls into an open window at Uncle Leo's house. Montgomery races into the house and tries to warn Uncle Leo, but he's nowhere to be found, and Montgomery assumes he must be at the school with Nan. He searches the entire house for this double, except notably the laboratory, and finds no sign of the evil twin. Nan arrives and wants to know what the hell is wrong with Montgomery and why he smashed an entire piano. He tries his best to explain the situation, and the kids end up thinking maybe they have an evil triplet or something. Nan then reveals that Uncle Leo never showed up to the performance, so he must be in his laboratory. They decide to go get him when Montgomery spots a paper on Uncle Leo's desk titled, The Future of Cloning. This causes Montgomery to quickly piece it all together and realizes Uncle Leo must have cloned him. Nan thinks it's impossible, but Montgomery reminds her how Uncle Leo stabbed him with a pin his first day and how ever since he's been dealing with this issue with the double. Nan takes Montgomery to Uncle Leo's laboratory, but when she opens the door she's frozen in shock because she spots not just one double of Montgomery, but four exact copies of him. Uncle Leo angrily tells the two kids he warned them to never come in here and then sticks his clones on them. Nan and Montgomery try to escape, but are quickly surrounded by the clones. At one point, Montgomery threatens to throw a beaker of liquid on the clones, but it's just tap water. Montgomery, Nan, and the clones all wrestle for a bit before the two kids are overpowered and locked in a broom closet. Things then get a little stay out of the basement-esque when they find another Uncle Leo unconscious in the back of the closet. They're able to wake him up and get some clarity on the story's events so far. 
Uncle Leo had been studying cloning and successfully cloned himself. He worked with this clone in the lab, where they had an understanding that the world couldn't see the clone until the research was fully complete. However, the clone must have snuck out when Montgomery was visiting that summer and taken a DNA sample from him, hence the surgery dream. The clone then proceeded to overpower Uncle Leo and clone all these Montgomerys. As a fun side note, we learned that Montgomery getting stabbed with a pin at the start of the story really was just an accident after all. We also learned that clone Uncle Leo had been hiding the clones of the Montgomerys all around the house in the spare bedrooms, so all those noises Montgomery was hearing at night were actually real. Nan wants to know how they can tell the originals from the clones, and Uncle Leo informs them that he made sure each clone has a special blue dot on the tip of their right thumb, and the other big difference is that the clones all turn out to be evil and love spreading misery, which is a significant change. Suddenly, two Montgomery clones appear and yank the real Montgomery out of the closet. They proceed to strap him down to a table, and clone Uncle Leo tattoos a blue dot on Montgomery's right thumb so he can match all the clones. The clones are all standing around admiring their handiwork, when Montgomery spots Nan sneaking out of the closet, so he starts to make a distraction by attacking one of the clones. This almost works, but Nan is spotted at the last second, and the clones chase after her through the house. 30 minutes pass, and the clones return without Nan. This infuriates clone Leo, and he declares he needs a nap. This gives Montgomery some quality time with all the clones, where he's unsettled by how they really are just like him, down to his laugh. The clones then declare it's initiation time, but this isn't much of initiation as much as it is just showing off. They light a burner and stick Montgomery's hand into the blue flame, searing his palm. The clones then all proceed to demonstrate that they're actually improvements on him because they're able to stick their hands in the flame unaffected, so the clones can't feel pain or get sick. Eventually, the clones decide it's bedtime and force Montgomery to go to sleep because they do everything together and they want him to act just like the rest of them. He lies awake in his cot waiting for his chance to escape again, and when he thinks it's safe, he heads towards the lab door. This goes nowhere though, because the moment he tries opening it, he's surrounded by four clones once again. There's then a loud banging at the door, and Nan is returned with three mystery men. The clone Uncle Leo demands to know who they are, but this just makes it obvious he's the clone, because they're Uncle Leo's old college roommates who I guess the real Uncle Leo wrote to asking for help a week earlier. It's a little confusing. Nan had tried to go to the police, but they didn't believe her, so she just waited in the garage until these guys showed up. Actually, it's convoluted and about to get worse. The roommates declare they set up a special laboratory in South America to deal with all the clones, and haul clone Uncle Leo off into a cargo van of some nature. I guess we're just supposed to assume these three old college roommates went on to be scientists themselves, maybe? Montgomery goes to hug Nan in celebration, but she's like back the fuck up, because she doesn't know who's a clone and who isn't. The clones take advantage of this and all begin professing to be the real Slim Shady. One of the roommates returns, and the real Uncle Leo thanks him for all his help. They then all turn to the five Montgomerys and try to suss out which one the real one is. One of the clones is extra devious and begins to share the train stealing story from earlier, which only Nan and Montgomery should know about. The real Montgomery realizes this clone must have been listening in a bedroom next door, but it's too late. Nan is convinced one of the clones is the real Montgomery. Things then progress rapidly as the real Montgomery is loaded up in a cargo van with the three other clones and hauled off. They're being taken to a loading dock to be shipped via boat to South America. I like that these three college roommates seemingly had a lab in South America, cargo van, and a boat all ready to go on a moment's notice. It's actually kind of concerning if I overthink it. Montgomery, the three clones, and the clone Uncle Leo are all sitting around in this van waiting to be shipped away when Montgomery notices a hatch in the van roof. He rallies the clones into helping him out the hatch with the promise that he'll return with some rope and pull the rest out so they can seek revenge on the original Montgomery. This almost works, but when Montgomery is nearly out of the hatch, he hurts his finger and shouts ouch, which immediately clues the other clones that he's the original, so they pull him back into their van to get their revenge. He then starts a conversation around how much he hates the name Montgomery, which all the clones agree is a terrible name. This then spirals into a war among the clones over what name they'd rather be called. See, I knew these names would be relevant later. The clones all end up in a wrestling match as Montgomery bangs on the door for help. A guard stationed outside the door opens the van and is shocked by what he sees. Montgomery begs this man for help before the brothers all kill each other and uses this moment to escape past the guard who thinks the boys must be quadruplets. This moment is pretty dumb, like dumber than the roommates in South America plotline. Apparently the roommates aren't standing guard of the van. They have a random security guard watching a van as it waited to leave for South America. What kind of business are these three roommates in where it's typical for them to be shipping vans of children out of the country? What are the implications of this? Stein lets the real Montgomery escape to the docks and then literally has him walk 8 miles back to Uncle Leo's house without any further event. He reaches the house in the morning and spots Nan, Uncle Leo, and the imposter clone eating breakfast at the table. Not just any breakfast though, frosted flakes of course. He rings the doorbell, with seemingly no real plan in place to prove he's the real Montgomery. The perspective of the story then shifts to Nan's, 
and she's eating frosted flakes with a clone unbeknownst to her. The doorbell rings and Clone Montgomery races to open it, only to be met with the real Montgomery. Nan watches as the two Montgomerys wrestle and fight for a bit before deciding to offer each of them a donut. The one Montgomery gobbles it down without hesitation, while the other Montgomery cautiously eats it and then proceeds to spew all over the kitchen floor. More vomit. Remember, clones can't feel pain or get sick. That's how they determine the clone Montgomery from the original one. Uncle Leo then locks the non-puking Montgomery in his lab to be hauled off to South America for God knows what. That night, Nan and Montgomery are watching TV when Nan wants praise for how clever she was with the donuts. However, in a final page twist, Montgomery laughs and says yes, but he's even smarter than her because he bought baked donuts instead of fried, meaning there was no peanut oil involved and the clone Montgomery forced himself to puke. Nan is horrified that they just shipped the real Montgomery off to South America and the clone Montgomery just wickedly smiles and says, Nan, I'm your evil twin. So that's how this one ends, with the real Montgomery being trafficked off to South America. Overall, I thought I Am Your Evil Twin was yet another good book. Montgomery was an okay protagonist who didn't do anything egregiously stupid, nor was he annoying, which is always a nice surprise. I enjoyed that this book didn't spend too much time with the mystery around the double and gave us plenty of time with the clones. I also love that we had a piano launched in this one. The ending twist is what makes this book, although I think changing perspectives made it a little obvious. I think it would have ended stronger if Stein just bleakly let Montgomery be hauled away in the first person perspective we started with. A low point has to be the convoluted college friends with a boat ready to go to South America. There had to be a better plotline to go with than that. But I'm still going to give this one 4-5 to five donuts. I did consider giving it 3, it just didn't feel right though. As far as the vomit count goes, we started out strong with vomit in the first 14 pages and then again in the climax of the story, giving us a total of 2 vomits for I Am Your Evil Twin. This brings our series 2000 total to 7 vomits. Well, that's it for I Am Your Evil Twin. I enjoyed this one more than I thought it would because I thought it would just fall into a pattern of Montgomery being framed for petty crimes like a living dummy book. Next week is Scares R Us, and in what will probably be typical for the rest of the series 2000 books, I have no idea what this is about or what to expect. Let me know in the comments you thought of I Am Your Evil Twin. Do people even eat baked donuts? Where's the fun in that? What was going on with this college roommate situation? Twins out there. Are you the good twin or the evil twin? Could you tell I was losing my voice during this episode? I'm hoping the audio quality is okay, I really just had to rush through it to get it done before my voice was gone. Also, what did you think of my twin-esque horror clips this week? After reading through TV tropes for ideas, this trope is more common than I realized. Anyways, as always, thanks again for watching, and make sure you subscribe for... The Pride. The Love.